All right. I think we're good to go. So welcome, welcome, welcome. This talk is a demo-based talk, so it's going to be a lot of hacking. It's going to be a lot of keyboard activity. There's going to be demos, all right? So things might break. Don't worry. Usually we fix it, okay? Don't feel bad for me if something breaks, if something doesn't work. Don't worry about it. I don't. This is hacking. Things tend to break, okay? Normally, things run okay, but still, we're going to mess around with some memory stuff. We're going to mess around with back doors. Things can crash and so on. So, I am Chris Dale. I am not Moriarty. Moriarty is a supervillain from the Sherlock Holmes books and videos, right? He's, in this case, the super hacker. Because how can Moriarty always stay one step ahead of the good guys? How is he always one step ahead of the detective Sherlock Holmes? I, in my opinion, it's quite obvious. He is the super hacker, and he has access to all the systems, all the backends, so he knows their plans, he knows what they're going to do, when they're going to do it. That way, he can stay one step ahead. So hacking is awesome. It's the way of the future for terrorists, for criminals, and that's why we also need to educate ourselves within cybersecurity, only because it's so tremendously big and important. My daily job is penetration testing, instant response. Normally, some people laugh when I say penetration testing because it sounds kind of funny. But it's basically just ethical hacking, professional hacking, right? So I try to break into customer systems in order to determine the business risk involved with those systems. I am, I'm also a teacher for SANS, so I travel around the world teaching hacking techniques and instant response and exploits and stuff like that. So I have a good time teaching all around the world, like Saudi Arabia was my last destination. It's like crazy everywhere they send me. So it's pretty cool. On my spare time, I also do a lot of hacking. So I'm actually lucky enough to have my hobby as my day job, because I always like to hack. And some of the results from hacking has been medals and prizes from different competitions. For example, I went to Washington, D.C. to play in what we call a tournament of champions, previous winners of Capture the Flag events, like competitions for hacking the most servers within a certain time limit. I went there and I placed 20th out of 164. That's not too shabby, but still, you do, there is a lot of community within information security, and if you want to get involved, please do so, because we need people, we need bright people, and especially people who have developer backgrounds, to help us actually combat the, the techniques and tools that the bad guys are using. So this talk, basically, we're going to be hacking, right? As I said, we're going to be hacking servers. And Moriarty is going to start out at a web server. So we're targeting an organization called Lead Host. It's a hosting provider. And this organization is actually quite secure when it comes to their external network. So they've had a lot of penetration tests happening. However, we're still going to look at how we can break in. So we're going to find a vulnerability. We're going to hack the web server. We're going to upload backdoors. And then we're going to make our way into the domain. And eventually, we're going to try to get keys to the kingdom, which is the domain administrator. right? So domain admin is like, when you have that, you can control the entire business. So my demo environment is quite simple. On my laptop, I have everything virtualized. I have my attacker, a Linux box, which is basically just Kali Linux virtualized. It's on the same host-only network as a server 2012, which has a web server and a database on it. Kind of standard setup, right? And behind that, so this is a DMZ, behind that I have my domain controller, which will serve the users, will serve policies, and such on. So as I said, it's a demo-based presentation. So why don't we just get on hacking, huh? So let's start with looking at the website, like that. Just let me fix my presentation mode a sec. Let me duplicate the screen. Looks good. So this is it, right? This is everything that is exposed. And let me challenge the audience. What would be your initial thought on how to hack this? Form. Anyone? Like, single injection, yes! So we're not going to do that. Nope. <laughs> because that would be easy. OK? So not too many customers today have SQL injection in their logins form still. 
because customers, they tend to get audited and pen tested on their external networks. So a lot of people have been slamming these services and login forms already auditing for known vulnerabilities, right? So instead, we're going to look at something called username enumeration and password spraying. Because what does most every single system have on the internet? They have login forms. If you can have a list of usernames, and if you can find just one user with a bad password, you will extend your attack surface of that system. And a lot of customers today, they will only have their external site pen tested because everyone already authenticated is trusted. We trust our users, right? That's a big mistake. <laughs> All right, so let's try to log on with something like admin, admin, right? I always try to figure out the system before I try to hack something. You will always see some new hacker immediately trying to hack something before he even understands what the system is doing. So first of all, we try to see what this system is doing. And it says, look, the login failed. Check your password, right? That's interesting. Not too subtle, but that's interesting that it says check your password. So what if I type in a random string? Blah, blah, and the C, test. It says, login failed, check your login name. Parenthesis, lo username. So that's interesting, right? It's very explicit in this example. But by actually testing admin and a username that we, don't, we know don't exist, we could immediately see that, look, we know that admin exists. So now we can use our word list to check which other users exist. For example, I could scrape the LinkedIn page of all the employees of the business and try first names against last names and so on to see, is there any usernames that exist in this system? If there are, they might have a weak password that we can attack. So we're going to default back to attacking users. It's always the easiest way in somewhere. So how do we go about attacking this? Well, first of all, I need to have a proxy set up. A proxy is just a tool which will capture all the requests from my web browser before they are being sent to the web server. So let me demonstrate. I'll try to log on again with like admin, admin. And right away, we can see that, look, it has captured my requested web server. I'm posting some data. I'm posting username admin, password admin. Let's go. So this request, when I press forward, this is what will be sent to the web server. And I, now I can edit it, and I can do whatever I want. But the interesting thing to do when doing a username enumeration is using what we call a fuzzer. A fuzzer is just a tool that will try multiple different types of values within a short time span, or whatever time span we set. So I just sent my request, my login request, to a fuzzer, and let me edit my little request. First of all, let me remove the cookie, because the cookie is going to make the web server have some kind of state on me. I don't want that. I want every request to be a fresh request. And then I'll define that, look, this little value here, admin, I replace it with some special characters, meaning that this value should be replaced with whatever payload I set. With whatever value I want it to be replaced with, it will be replaced. And let's look at some values to replace. So I have a little text file with different usernames, known usernames from like Linux systems, like uh, PHBBB, and so on. Just a list of typical usernames, OK? So I've just loaded these in here. And every single one of these text strings will be replaced within here. right? Quite simple. So these values down here, it's going to be the, the, our testing. And then I need to do some quick options, because this login field is kind of special. So it has some funky, funky settings, so I need to process redirections, and I need to process cookies. And basically, that's it. Let's see what happens when we press attack. Oops. It's not going to take 10 minutes. Don't worry. <laughs> so immediately, you will see that my system is now trying to log in with different usernames. Boom, 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 boom. It's just different usernames. Go, 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 go. All with the same password, admin, right? So we're not really trying to log on with any users. We're just trying to see what the error message is. Let me demonstrate the error message in my tool. Login failed, check your password, right? That means that this username 
of admin exists. And also notice that the content length of this request, the request, the response, sorry, coming back from the web server is 1472, while all the other ones are 1485, right? So we have an outlier. So let's sort by those and see, look, suddenly we have a pattern of what we can assume is known usernames within application. That is a really interesting thing to find. However, most pen testers today, they would classify this finding as a low, maybe medium risk finding in your application. And it probably won't recommend you to patch it immediately. Well, it sh perhaps it should. We'll, we'll see in a minute, right? So now that we have a list of users, let's take those users and add them to the list again. In our fuzzer, let's define another value, the password field. Now we want to try all the known usernames against weak passwords. And typical weak passwords will be like, for this case, it will be lead hosts 2016, summer 16, uh, Leto sucks 16, for those that don't like their company and their, their employer, and so on. So let me show you how I can change my attack that for every username, I will try a full list of passwords, okay? So I'll change my attack to what they've dubbed cluster bomb attack. Sounds fancy, right? And I'll give it um, a, a list of passwords. So these passwords in here, those are just like ABC123, access, admin, admin123, change me. Change me is actually a lot of places for default configuration on switches and routers and stuff. It's quite, quite nasty. So just, just a series of passwords, right? Oh, let's try again. So you'll see. It's trying, for every username now, it's trying the password A, A, A. And then it starts doing A, B, C for every username. Oh, sorry. So it's just trying to log on, right? And how do we determine who is logged on? Well, again, we just sort by the length to see what is the difference? Who is the outlier here? And immediately, we see that the payload on the left side, Gordon B, username Gordon B, seems to have the password A, B, C, one, two, three. And let's check. Let's check what responses have come back from the web server. Let's do the render. Ooh. Dun, 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 dun. Aha! It says, greetings, Gordon B. So a very simple attack showing how we could actually find a user to gain a login with. Let's see, Gordon B. Actually, this is still hanging in my proxy, so let's go back here. Let's try to log on with Gordon B. Gordon B. A, B, C, one, two, three. And it works, right? So suddenly, we now have an increased attack surface. And this is important because this is the place most businesses forget to test. So in my pen testing endeavors, I always ask to have credentials from a user. Like, give me a test user's user so I can test within the application itself because we need to assume that the bad guys already have access to our internal network and our uh, external applications as a logged in user. We have to assume that. We have to assume the worst. And most likely, they do have some kind of access if they want access. So we got some functionality here. We'll look at that in a second. But just a couple of quick PowerPoint slides. So how do you protect against this? Well, we could simply shun users or IP addresses that make multiple failed logins, right? That could be really problematic, especially when you have big customers that are all coming from one IP and they're using your system and they, would, they, they might have like 200, 300 um, failed login attempts per day, for example. So you can't just block someone per an IP. Uh, you could implement CAPTCHA, you know, these little text forms that will ask you questions like, find a cat. Whoa. Oh, nice. So, so, so we got one guy giving me a heads up. Look, look at this stuff. <laughs> And all, all the rest of you are like, ha, 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 this guy is making a fool of himself. But let, let me try to uh, duplicate it and do an F5. And we need to go, uh, actually shouldn't do F5. I should actually do the, the button. So where you have to figure out the pictures of the cats, and you click the cats, and you're, you can log in once you have done those things, right? So that works somewhat, but uh, we can break those as well. So it, it helps adding an uh, extra layer of security. You could make the attack really slow, so the, so the login form could take a really long time to process. Uh, 
That is actually good practice. As developers, you guys should make the login forms take a long time because the password algorithm that you're using to hash the passwords, hopefully you are doing that, should be slow. It should be slow. It should take like a second or two or three to create the password hash of the user's uh, password. So that compare should also take time. And of course, two-factor authentication would definitely break this attack, most likely, right? If I had to steal someone's phone, it would be harder. So with that, we can now see what else exists on this web server. And I'd like to remind you, though, this could be game over from here. We have Gordon B's username and his password, right? What is the chances that Gordon B is using a different password for every single service he is using? It's quite low, right? I actually do it. I have a password manager and I have like unique passwords for everything. So actually, I, I could actually show you my Facebook password and it wouldn't really hurt anyone because it's like this long. And if you could remember that, I would love to have you hack me like that. That would be cool. <laughs> but think of like VPN endpoints. A lot of businesses have some kind of VPN login somewhere. Could you just log on with Gordon B, ABC123, on their VPN and have ex internal access to the network? I think you could. Most likely, you could just port scan their network, find their VPN endpoint, authenticate, and it's game over. Could be that easy, right? But no. We're going to look at this web application. We're going to find some exploits, and we're going to see how we can use it to gain uh, a backdoor on the system. So let's see. Back to the web application. Let me do this. Like that. So. We, got, we seem to have some kind of functionality here, right? It looks like a control panel of some sort. Uh, we can ping a server. We can do a user search. And we have an About Us page. This About Us page is interesting because it says that if you're worried about security, you shouldn't be because they have everything in order. <laughs> uh, really, you're laughing. But if you think about it, what is most vendors saying to you today? Oh, hey, look, security worried about it? And don't worry. We have like the best teams in the world. They're all on top of everything. All right, so there are some interesting uh, vulnerabilities in every single page here. That's all right. So, so I, I know the developer who made this. It, it might be me. But, but there are some interesting parameters up here that's interesting. Uh, the user search might be connected to a database, so there might be some SQL injection going on. However, for this audience, because most of you aren't security people, I'll be demonstrating the ping a server hack. So in this example, it says, enter the IP address you want to ping. And there's a list of the IP addresses that most likely, those are mine, right? Those are Gordon B's IP addresses. So always, the first thing we do, is try, try the functionality and see how it works. So we click ping, ping that IP address, one of the lists, and it gives us the reply. And this reply is kind of familiar, isn't it? What does it look like? Mm. It looks like ping, yeah, but it looks like ping from Windows, like from the Windows command line. So immediately we're thinking, aha, the developer probably didn't want to write his own ping in PHP or .NET, right? So he just made a system call down to the OS and made an OS ping for him and just read the response from that. Really good idea because then you don't have to rewrite functionality. You can basically just reuse it and should be good, right? So let's try something else. Like, an interesting IP address to ping would maybe be like localhost. Can I ping something else that isn't in the list? Just to, just to learn, right? I'm interested. I'm curious. Aha. Uh -huh. I get four replies from localhost. So it looks like I can ping anything. So I could perhaps try to ping Google if I was online, or I could ping anyone. I could tickle you with a ping if I wanted to. But do I really want to do that? No. Let's try something else. Let's, let's try to like add parameters. Like only ping one time. Does this work? And immediately, I got a response. Much quicker, right? Aha, uh -huh, so I can actually add attributes to the ping command. Hmm. What about like Windows and Linux, Solaris, and most likely all the OSs? They have a way to concatenate commands. So if you have one command on the left side, if that runs OK, run this command. So let's try that. Let's, let's see. Let's see. Let's see. The ampersand will concatenate another command. Let's try like dir, like show, show the directory contents. Aha, uh -huh. 
suddenly we have like some kind of code execution, right? But we're limited to the commands in the OS. So what would be like from here? How would you hack this server? You can run any command on Windows that you want. How would you do it? Say what? Python. Python? Yeah, definitely try Python. Uh, but we're on a uh, Windows box, and so let's try let's try PowerShell, right? Yes, let's try PowerShell. By the way, if this was Linux, this would be game over from here. Okay, we would do like a netcat backdoor, and we would have a, a fully functional uh, functionality backdoor in within two minutes, right? From here, from here. But we still have like uh, 40 minutes to go, so. So I'll do PowerShell command, and I'll do the ls command, which is basically the same thing as dir. PowerShell dash command ls, and suddenly we have the same type of input. So now we have a programming environment at our hands. The attacker can now basically run any programming, PowerShell programming command, command line that he wants to, and that gives us flexibility, right? That gives us a heap of flexibility. So let's see if we can find something interesting. For example, who, which user are we running? Like, can I do like uh, ls percent user profile? Can I expand variables? And it looks like it can. Looks like we're running as a user lead web dot lead host. So lead host. So I'm missing a seven in there. I wonder why. <coughs> it was a typo when I set up the server. I noticed it like when I started my demo, and I'm like, What's, why is there a missing a seven? And I'm, I'm, so, I'm so, so stupid. I was thinking. But right, so we can now agree that this is quite dangerous, right? We can run anything, and we can get responses back with PowerShell. So let's do uh, a quick recap of what, what actually went wrong here and how we can defend against this type of, uh, type of attack. So first of all, developers made a mistake. They didn't properly sanitize the input coming from the user. They didn't think that you could actually break out of the command and, and actually do s different stuff. So there should definitely be some whitelisting and filtering going on, for sure. A web application firewall could have rules preventing this type of attack. However, in most cases, we're able to bypass those. Okay? It just takes a little bit more trying and failing, and we can most likely bypass web application firewalls. But they're still nice to have, don't get me wrong. Um, also, web application firewalls support whitelisting. So you can set up a regex saying that, look, an IP address should only have like three numbers and a dot, one to three numbers and a dot, and so on. That would be really hard to hack, wouldn't it? If you, the only characters that you can input into that field was numbers and dots, I don't know how to hack that. So that's definitely something good. Uh, what about source code analysis? You could have tools. There are lots of tools out there, free and commercial, that will automatically scan your source code, source code looking for known weaknesses. Like, oh, here's a blunder. This is most likely a blunder because you're using the exec command, for example. It's very dangerous. Oh, you have a cross-site scripting vulnerability because you're not filtering. So there are tools to do that for you. And of course, penetration testing would definitely find this. I mean, if, if your pen test team doesn't find something as open as this, yeah, you should, re you should have a refund, to be honest. And then there's the vulnerability scanning parts, which is basically a tool that will try to simulate an attacker and see what's going on. But still, we're not done yet, right? We need more access. We, Moriarty, he's, he's quite crazy, so he's not going to give up from just having some kind of remote command and execution. He wants full access. So preferably, <clears throat> we want to have RDP, OK? Some kind of GUI, it's just so we can show that the mouse is moving around and things are happening, OK? So let's, let's see how that works. So bring up my Firefox. So how would we go about like, uploading a backdoor? Like, what's that all about? Well, first, we need to create the backdoor. We need to create some kind of malware slash virus to actually help us out. And that's quite simple. So, it's actually super simple today, because as they do in the developer world, they also do it in the security industry. They try to make things as simple as possible to like show the impact of something, right? So right here is my server. I'm not going to touch that, because that would be cheating. But here is my Linux. 
Hopefully things are working. You never know. But let's see. Actually, there's some debugging from before. Let me check my IP address. Looks like I'm on the same network. You can all see that, right? In the back, is it OK, size? Good stuff. So I'm on the same network, so I should be able to ping 102.68. Looks good, right? So in Kali Linux, there is a tool called MSF Venom. It's packaged within a framework called Metasploit. MSF Venom allows us to create viruses. We can create PowerShell viruses, Visual Basic viruses, Linux viruses, and executable files. So let's create an executable file. Let's see if I have a, nope. So I have a little cheat sheet. I'm going to copy paste some things just because it makes things easier. And you guys don't want to show, uh, you, you don't really want to see my typos going on everywhere. So let's paste that in here. So I'm telling my little MSF Venom tool that I want to create an executable with the payload Meterpreter. Meterpreter is an in-memory rootkit for Windows. It will allow me full access to the system with the, with the permissions the user is running as. So that's the first part here. And then we have a remote connection coming back to us. So we're telling anyone who is clicking our file that we will be creating now, they should be connecting back to our IP address. So normally, this would be an online IP address, right? I would have my domain name in there. I have a special pen testing domain name, which I use for this stuff. And which port they should connect on. So this will bypass every single firewall rule in the world, most likely, because people are not filtering where they are allowed to go on the internet. Most of people aren't. And we'll put this inside our web server. So let's see. Can I actually visit this? my own attacking machine now and see if there's a backdoor.exe. Yes. So when I visit my little URL from the attacker machine up here, this is my Linux box, we have our payload ready. The executable is ready to, to be sent somewhere, right? How do we get this file on board? Well, it, with PowerShell, maybe some of you guys know this already, but you can actually do just about everything with PowerShell, OK? So we can actually do a simple command called invoke web request. And it will actually pretend to be a little browser, and it will go out online pulling down whatever file you want. So that's interesting. Let me copy that little command as well from the cheat sheet, just to make sure we don't have typos. So I'll show you. So we do the PowerShell. This is our command injection, right? We have PowerShell dash command, invoke web request, really nice commandlet, and we point it to our attacker IP address. We point it to the backdoor.exe. I'm sorry if it's a little bit small. And we say, look, this file should be written to the user profile, which is people's home directory, right? Slash user, slash lead host, and so on. And we'll name the file backdoor.exe. Let's see what happens. Did I click? Oh, yeah, I did click. Looks like it clicked. Uh, let's see if we can um, see if the file has been written. So we'll do ls, user profile. And voila, we now suddenly have a file on the system. We told PowerShell through the web server to, hey, go out to the internet, pull down a file, pull down malware, and store it on the system. But we haven't executed anything, have we? No. we just. We just downloaded it. Before we run it, though, we need to set up a server. We need to have some kind of way to process a backdoor coming back to us. So for that, I'm going to be, uh, I'm going to be using uh, the Metasploit framework. Basically, it's a framework for hacking. Makes things simple. Let's see if we can find it. Should have it up in the background here. We have some options, just verifying that everything is looking good. And I'll set up my little server. So this server will just wait for anyone who is trying to connect back to me with the, uh, with the virus I've created. And if they are clicking on a virus, connecting back to me, we should interact with it and have some kind of remote control. So let's see what happens if we click the file. Huh, you click the file. Well, you don't really click the file, but you run the file, right? You use PowerShell. Don't even need to use PowerShell. Let's just do ampersand. 
user profile slash backdoor.exe. This should run the command, shouldn't it? Just like you would run ping from like system32 or the Windows folder, this should run this executable. So let's see. Hmm. Hmm. It's just hanging. Oh. It doesn't return anything, right? That's interesting because it's waiting for this executable to complete. Just like it was waiting for ping to complete, it's waiting for backdoor to complete. And backdoor is connecting back to me. So let's look at our Linux and see if we have anything going on. Oh, uh, we do. It says, look, Meterper, Meterpreter session two has been opened. You have an incoming connection from this web server. Interesting. Let's try to interact with it. And suddenly, we have command execution from a shell. So we can run dir, L, oh sorry, ls, we can type uh, get uid, for example, or let's do help. Let's look at the commands we can actually run from this. So I can kill any process that, process that I want to. I can migrate my process, so instead of being inside the Apache web server, I can migrate the, the full rootkit, the code of it, through memory into, for example, explorer.exe. Because explorer.exe is never closed, right? So it's going to persist my malware, ensuring that it won't get closed when someone reboots the web server, or a thread or an or a application pool dies, for example. So very nice functionality. I can cat files, I can remove files, I can upload files. I can uh, do typical networking commands here. And some interesting ones are, I can do a key scan start. This is a key logger. So I can just start the key logger, have it running for 24 hours, dump the output tomorrow, and I'll have whatever is typed on the keyboard on this, uh, from the server on my system. That's really, really nice. I could even, if this was a client PC, right? If this wasn't a server, I could activate the web camera and take a little snapshot of whoever's sitting behind the screen. I could even have it stream data from me. And I've done this a couple of times, specifically for TV2, a big news channel in Norway. And I've done it against Stola Dirigov, a news anchor. He asked me like the day before my interview, he asked me, hey, is it like, can you hack my Facebook? Is it simple? And like, it's not really simple to hack Facebook, but it could be simple to hack you. Uh, are you giving me permissions? And he's like, yeah, well, yeah, why not? Uh, yeah, for sure. I, I got a screenshot of him. His face is kind of, uh, ah. And I also did it to another reporter in TV2. And they're using this uh, material actually for, for internal training right now to try to educate people better, to don't click viruses, basically. So lots of different cool commands we can do from here. Um, so this is our backdoor running, right? And that's all nice and good. But let's look at some defenses from this. No, wait. We, were, we, we told you that we're going to gain RDP. Sorry, this is not RDP. This is only like a command access. So let's look at how we can get some RDP action here. So on a system, the first thing an attacker will do, if it's remotely good, OK, he's going to try dump the password hashes from the system. That means he's going to try to gain the passwords but they're not in clear text most of the time. They're hashed. So he wants those so he can start cracking them to try to gain passwords, because they can be used elsewhere as well. So for that, I want to upload some files. Some files. So my little tool here, my interpreter, my little back door, supports uploading files. As we saw in the help list, I could simply say, I want to, did you see that? <laughs> I, I should be offline, so I don't want any like emails popping up like, hey, Chris, it was uh, really fun last night. <laughs> I don't want that stuff to happen. So I'm going to be uploading my kit, my files. My, I have a little zip file, right, with all my like hacker tools that I want onto the system. Most attackers or hackers, they have their own kit. And we'll upload the kit because it, it has some interesting uh, features. Let's see. It's 18 megabytes. It's fine. And it looks like it uploaded. So from here, I kind of like going back to the Windows command line. So I'll type shell, and look at that. We have like the Windows command line at our service. So from here, I could do like cd dash dash, cd dot dot, cd dot dot, whatever. I could do dir. I could do cd users. I could do cd delete web dot delete host. I could type dir, 
I can see that. Look, I have my files uploaded. So here's my backdoor that we're currently running, right? We're, we're inside this backdoor.exe, but just uploaded these files from Meterpreter. So it's a zip file, right? How do you unzip from the command line in Windows? What? Ah, <laughs> you wish. You wish it was just like unzip, like it would be in any other operating system, like Linux, for example. <laughs> let's try unzip. No, there's, there's like nothing that will help you unzip on Windows from the command line, except PowerShell. And I'll be honest, I'll be honest, though, I'm not going to try type this command, because it's hilariously long. <laughs> Look at this stuff. This is unzipping from the command line in Windows. If anyone ever has a better way of doing this than this way, let me know after my talk, OK? But this should hopefully extract my files. And look at that. We have our files extracted. That's good stuff. So inside here, I have a tool called Mimikatz. It's from GitHub. That's fine. It's a an, it's an really nice tool that will try to look through. It will scrape through memory looking for passwords in clear text and ha in, ha in a hashed form. So this tool is, is actually very, very nice for attackers to use. Let's run it. Uh, I believe we need to have uh, the debug privileges. Oops, that's a typo. That's why we do the copy pasting, right? Privilege debug. So that means I'm granting this tool to have debug privileges inside Windows. And I know there's a lot of .NET developers here. So you might know what the debug privilege means for a user in Windows. Local administrators normally have debug privileges. It means that a process can interact with another process, debugging it, and also having its code run inside other processes' code and even access the memory space of those processes. So that's what we're doing here. If we didn't have local admin in this case, it wouldn't happen. So let's cover that in a bit, OK? Then we'll do secure LSA log on password. Again, typo. Let's just do the copy pasting, Chris. It's no problem. Much easier to just do copy paste. We'll tell Mimikatz to look for log on passwords. And we have a long list of outputs. Let's look at these things. The first thing we have is an interactive logon to the computer from the administrator. And this user has no password. Interesting. There is a hash here that we could crack, or we could use as an authentication mechanism. But still, there's no password in clear text. That's because Windows Server 2012 R2 actually has something called protected admin. So they try not to store the user's clear text password in memory. So it's a really good security feature added by Windows. And let's look for uh, different things here. Oh, look at this. Suddenly, we have the web user, the password in clear text, because that user wasn't covered by the protected admin module. So Mimikas simply took the password straight out of memory, and we could use this for remote authentication. That's no fun, is it? It's just having the password in clear text? Nah. <laughs> so this MTLM hash that I've highlighted is the password representation, right? So let's just pretend we don't have any clear text password, OK? Let's crack this little sucker. So for cracking, I will be using a tool called Hashcat. Hashcat will interact with my GPU, and it will try Super many. It will actually try to crack. It will try to crack 66,000 plus three zeros, like, like 66 millions, 6.6 million passwords a second. It's going to try cracking the hash. So I have a word list, right, with 58 million words in it. My word list will be what we call mangled. So I'm going to try lead speak replacement. So every I will be replaced with an one. Every, uh, I'll add exclamation marks. I'll automatically add like 2016 behind every word. And I'll crack it. And running this GPU cracking tool, it's super quick. And we can see that the password crack almost instantly. This hash, which I copy pasted, 
represented the password manager 007. So really, from here, all we have to do, hopefully, is try to authenticate. Oh, that's the domain controller. Let's see. Username is correct, so let's do manager 007. Aha. Uh -huh. So we could suddenly log on to the web server. That's cool. And as any good attacker does, the first thing you do when you hack something is you bring up the terminal window. <laughs> because you don't really need a GUI, right? You really don't need a GUI. Let's see, yeah. So we are running as this user, uh, let's see, uh, Lead Web. So that's interesting. We can now browse through the system. We could like look for uh, network machines if there's anything on here. Look through a local disk. Look through the scripts that is hosted from, for example, Apache. So we can basically do whatever access this user have. From the GUI, a lot of people appreciate the GUI, but we don't really need it, as you've seen. So let's cover some defenses for this, because it's kind of important. It's kind of important not to have this happen to your environment. First of all, believe it or not, antivirus could help. All right, it could help. So we'll bypass antivirus, no problem. Okay, any time of the week, we'll bypass antivirus. However, we're lazy. Attackers are very often lazy, so they'll get caught a couple of times by the antivirus while they're trying and failing, and that will create alarms in your environment. So hopefully, your IT operations will actually react to those alarms and check out why this web server is acting strangely, right? Also, your firewall rules should never allow a server to talk to the internet. Why would your servers be allowed to talk to anyone on the internet? It's quite stupid. You should allow connections coming in, and you should allow your server to reply to those connections. That's a stateful firewall, right? But you should not allow this web server to initiate connections to anyone on the internet. That's just bad practice. And again, our user, the web user, was the uh, local admin. And that's interesting. Why was it local admin? Well, turns out that IT operations have big problems with permissions. <laughs> Windows permissions is hell. And basically, to fix the problem, they just gave the user all the permissions, and it worked. And they're like, huh, that's convenient. And they lost it like that. But this user is not domain admin, OK? So he doesn't have any access except access to the web server. While domain admin access means access to the entire kingdom. It's keys to the kingdom. OK? So we're going to go back to the demo and look at how can we use our access to elevate our privileges to become domain admin. That's our next goal. So let's look at this server again then. We'll be using, we can use, uh, let's see, close this one. I think we can just use the RDP. That should work because, I mean, it's a legitimate connection, right? We are the hacker. We're on top of the server. So let's see. Um, let's go back to our files and see which other files we have on our system. So while, when I uploaded files, my little toolkit, my kit, we also uploaded something called a PyCAC. Does anyone know what the PyCAC is? It's a Python Kerberos exploit kit. Mm. And Kerberos is authentication protocol for Microsoft and Windows machines, right? Microsoft Windows machines. Those are, those are most likely all using Kerberos for authentication. It's, it's quite good protocol. However, in 2014, late 2014, there was a Windows update patch. You guys know those, right? Windows updates? <laughs> They're kind of important, actually. There was one patch, MS14-068. So 14 means that it's re it, it was released in 2014, and 6.8 is the number they've given it. It was a vulnerability that allowed anyone to create a fake Kerberos authentication ticket pretending to be domain admin. Huh. That is bad. Any domain user can suddenly become king in your environment. Can you imagine that? If you don't patch that immediately, any willy-nilly script kitty or, or anyone who wants to take full access to your kingdom could do it. 
just like that. And I'll show you just like that. It would be kind of embarrassing if this demo failed right now. <laughs> As I probably, it's just going to be like that. And I can't do it, right? So let's run up PyCAC and let's see what it's all about. So I've downloaded the, the, the proof of concept code that will allow me to run this, uh, this code. This, this little file, I'll run it first. Let's see, let's see how it behaves. I think we have time. Looks good. Ooh. Oh, sorry, Python. So this script requires some parameters. First of all, it requires the SID, the user's SID. Then it needs to have the domain controller's IP address and the, the domain we're talking to. So the SID is basically this long string up here. So it's no, it's no secrets. It's just your unique identifier to the domain. So it's not really a lot of advanced stuff going on here. So I'm going to give these parameters to the tool. And let's see if we can create a ticket. And it requires a password. So that's the interesting thing, right? We need to have some kind of password in clear text. And our password was, yes, manager007. I had my demo fail once because I typed in master007 multiple times. <laughs> Manager007, I will never do that mistake again. So it, it gives us a lot of done messages. Looks good, right? We type dir, and we have a little file here. This file is basically a ticket granting ticket. It's, it's basically a ticket giving us authentication. But it's just as a file, right? We need some way to load it into the system. Actually, we'll be loading it into memory. And we'll be doing that using a different tool called Mimikatz, which has a lot of Kerberos interaction modules as well. So Mimikatz supports interacting with Kerberos tickets. And we'll use Mimikatz to push this ticket inside our memory. So let's uh, cd into the correct directory. Oh well. Let me get Strunk. <coughs> so Mimikatz can be run interactively, or it can be run from the command line. Right now, I'll run it strictly from the command line, giving it the parameters to pass this ticket into memory, and I'll point it to c colon slash users and our user, the, the user file I just created, the ticket file, and I'll exit immediately. Let's try this. Actually, wait. Before I do, I, I promised you I wasn't domain admin, right? Challenge me. Like, no, oh, he's lying. He's probably domain admin. All right? So, yes, <laughs> I'm not a domain admin. So let's check, okay? Let's do a check net user group domain admins and see. The users in the domain admin group is the administrator, only one user, right? Let me try also net use. Let me copy that command because my host name for the domain controller is hilariously bad. Let me try to mount the C drive, OK? The C drive of the domain controller. You shouldn't be able to, to interact with that drive and browse the files unless you have per permissions. And as you can see, that it's giving me the prompt to enter your username and password. That means it already tried your credentials as the lead web user, and it didn't work. So please give me the permissions. We'll cancel out that. And that's a proof of concept. I just showed you. We don't have access, right? And let's now load this little uh, ticket into memory. Let's see. There it is. Looks good. <coughs> Did you see that? <laughs> you never know what kind of information you will be showing people. So I just listed out my tickets. And uh, to be honest, it looks good. Let's try the net use again. Basically, I'm mapping a network drive. Nope. Let's see. Win, 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 win. But, 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 but. Okay, let's purge. Let's do this again. I just removed all the tickets. Oh, and it doesn't work. So I said it would be embarrassing if it didn't work. And it's actually quite embarrassing right now. <laughs> but just give me a second to debug. Let's see, let's see. Uh, we have, let's see. I think we need to look at our ticket. Let's see how our command ran. Let's see. This one, let's see. We're giving it this Python script. <clears throat> yeah. We're giving it a username, a domain. We're giving the SID, and I verified the SID earlier today. It should work. 
and the domain lead host. So that should work. Let's actually create another ticket because I think something went wrong. You never know. And th these things, they've been written to be easy, but they're not like super robust. So you never know, right? Uh, let's see. Let's run it one more time. Nope, wrong command. Let's see. We have our command up here. This one. And to be honest, it looks good to me. Manager 007. That's my password, by the way. So check it out. Try it my LinkedIn and so on. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. And yeah, it did say done on everything. So let's go back to Mimikat. Let's just try it one more time. If it doesn't work, I'll show you guys still. So don't worry about it. So no, I want to purge my tickets first. First, just remove all the tickets, all the authentication tickets you already have on the system. Just remove those so you have a clear, clean slate, right? Looks good. Leap web, lead host. Would be cool if it actually works, but this. the honest truth though is I, I tested this like 30 minutes before I came down here for the demo. And, and I rebooted it just to make sure that there wasn't any caching going on. Ah, and it worked, right? Yeah. Oh, nice, thank you, thank you. <laughs> nice, nice. So let's browse the domain controller. Let's look in the Windows directory. Let's look in System32. Let's look for a very specific file that is called ntds.dit. This file, 8.4 gigabytes. What file is this? AD. AD. This is Active Directory, OK? Copy this file back to your own system. You have all the user hashes of all the users in the domain. All right? Let's just look at a couple of things here. So what went wrong? We forgot Windows Update. I have clients that refuses to patch domain controllers because they are afraid they will crash while they're doing so. If the domain controllers go down, everything goes down. So their most vulnerable services in the entire organization, multinational companies, is the domain controller. So I had them patch this, specifically this. I forced them to patch this. So definitely, Windows updates matter. But I want to bring up a scenario, which I'm not going to demo because it takes a little while. But with this AD dumped, I have a very specific of special users password hash, the KRB TGT user. This user is a user that creates tickets. If I have that user's hash, I can basically create tickets to my own on demand whenever I want to. And I can create tickets that will grant me 10 years, for example, of domain admin to your environment. Ooh. And how do you fix that? Well, it turns out that if you change your KRB TGT hash, the password, if you change the password two times, my ticket will be invalidated. And I would have to hack them again and dump the hash. But two times, it goes two times because a password rotation and a history it has to rotate so it doesn't remember the hash I had when I dumped it. And just if you try to reset that user two times, you're going to have hell. It's not going to be pretty. Your link is going to die. Exchange is probably going to die. You're going to have stuff happening that you can't explain because so many things re is relying on having week-long tickets in their systems. So when suddenly all the tickets are invalidated, things stop working. So normally, you would have to like, wait a week and then reset the second time, giving the attacker a lot of time to regain his foothold, dump the hashes again, try to compromise different users, compromise domain admins that, that didn't reset their password, and so on. It's really, really hard to recover from. All right, so I think we're on time. Is there any questions? Because we have five minutes, don't we? Five minutes, yeah? So is there any questions on this hacking activities? I expect there to be questions because I'm Norwegian and you're Norwegians and everyone is saying that Norwegians, they don't ask questions. So bring it on. Come on, go. If you had local admin apps, could you uninstall the Windows Update patch? Ooh, definitely you could, but not on a domain controller. 
So this patch is for the domain control, but I love the idea, though, to uninstall the protective mechanisms. We do that for AV sometimes when we have local admin. <laughs> Good question, All right? Are you in a region? Ah, represent. <laughs> <laughs> nice. All right, anyone else before we finish? Okay, go. So very valid question. So this tool is open source, so you can go manually and review the source code. For many of my tools and my team, we actually do source code review before we use tools, especially new tools that have just been released. There are multiple cases online where we've seen people releasing some kind of tool and it's actually infected, right? So you suddenly have access to a security researcher's PC because they were dumb enough to run your tool without checking it. But tools such as like Metasploit, Metrepreter, MSF Venom, those have been scrutinized by the security industry for many, many, many years. It's a very highly renowned company called Rapid7, which is developing it. And they have a quite good reputation, so to so speak, right? So that's nice, at least. That gives you some assurance. Anyone else? All right. So thank you very much, everyone. I'm glad we got a full pack of people in here. Thank you very much. <laughs>